Hello, my name is Eric Ford. This is the Healthcare Innovation class, and I'd like to talk to you about artificial intelligence and beyond. And in particular, I want to talk about generative language models and their applications. Uh, this is a fairly recent development that has really taken off and is getting a lot of media coverage at the current. And to say that it's a game changer is probably a gross understatement. I'm going to give you a quick primer or primer, if you're from the English version, uh, on artificial intelligence. It's been a topic of discussion for well over 75 or 80 years. I'll talk about where we are in the development of AI applications. How do we test to see if we really have an AI? I'll give you the case at hand, which happens to be a generative language processing application called GPT-3, which is produced by a company called OpenAI. And it's only one of many, many, many uh, applications that is doing very similar work. However, this particular application has caught the public's uh, imagination for two reasons. One is it's performing exceedingly well. <laughs> and second, it's open. Uh, as the name of the company would tell you, to the public. Uh, so it's really taken over. So a very brief overview of artificial intelligence. What do we mean when we say artificial intelligence? Is it making computers that think? Uh, I've heard one suggestion that all human beings are is neural networks with electricity running through them that we get through our elementary canal. Maybe we're, we're essentially two networks, one of which happens to be the one that runs from our mouth through our stomach and provides energy, and the other is the neural network that draws energy off of that, and we use it to think. Uh, are we making computers think? And it's a big question and not a trivial question. Uh, we're very good at making them run algorithms making them do simple calculations, making them do simple calculations repeatedly. And I'm going to give an ethics lecture. And one question we might ask in the ethics class is, are we being mean to the machines? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, what, all, what is it we're trying to automate? And is automating something the same as making it intelligent? And I don't think that is. Uh, can we create machines that perform multiple functions that require what approximates intelligence? We've been very good at creating single function machines. You can think about things like the abacus or the slide ruler. They were very good for performing mathematical functions. They were not great for a lot of other things. And we can also think about the study of mental faculties through the use of computational models. And a lot of this goes back to the decision-making and can we program decision-making and do probabilistic decision-making. If you've ever watched uh, a Texas Hold'em tournament, uh, the people who are playing are making a variety of calculations. What are the odds that their hand will win? Given the size of the pot, what are the pot odds and how do those affect what you need as a winning hand, those sorts of things. And it's essentially multiple computational models running over and over. And then, oh, by the way, can I bluff? And so there's been a lot of work on games as it comes to computational models. At this juncture, uh, it'd be very difficult to beat most computers at a game of chess. They have essentially infinite capacity and they've become very adept at calculating the probabilities of move after move after move. And we're gonna talk about this generative aspect of one move following another, because as it comes to language, a lot of what we're seeing right now is the autofill. For those of you who have an iPhone and text message or other things, they often tell you what they think the next word you want to fill in is. And as you go further and further down the words, uh, they can become rather absurd, uh, the sentences as a whole, if you're not careful. A couple of other ways people think about AI, artificial intelligence. 
is the study of computations and making it perceive, reason, and act as we would expect humans to. The last one, and I'll just jump down to the bottom of this quote, is uh, AI is one way of thinking about it's whatever computer science we don't currently have. Uh, it's the always the promise of the future. And I would tell you at this juncture, we don't have anything nearly approximating a true AI. So there are philo philosophical bases for AI. It's the study of human intelligence in many regards, and what does it take to approximate human intelligence? Uh, we've seen over and over with other species that they tend to exceed uh, what we previously classified as the determinant of being a human. For example, the use of tools. We know that many primates though use tools. The ability to teach other uh, animals to use the tools. Uh, crows, as it turns out, are extraordinarily intelligent, and I'm using the word in its true sense, in that they will teach other crows how to use simple tools to achieve their goals. So whenever we think of, we've put out a marker as to what it is to be human in terms of our intelligence and how it differentiates us from the rest of the animal kingdom, they tend to come up fairly short including self-recognition. There's been some fairly famous studies where they have elephants look in mirrors and be able to tell that they are self-aware of who they are and what it means. So again, it's this question of what is a machine versus what is a human. Uh, mathematics, uh, needless to say, it is huge in mathematics and we're talking about computational logic and probability calculations. Uh, my personal favorite author in the management domain is a pers person called Herbert Simon. He was very famous. He won the Nobel Prize. He's actually a sociologist, and he talks about decision theory and how probability and utility and something called satisficing change the way that humans make decisions. But he also tried to model it in such a way that we could make computers do it truly a singular genius. And to this day, much in the same way uh, physicists read Einstein's work and gain new insights and realize that 100 years on, they didn't fully understand what was being said in the papers that Einstein wrote. Herb Simon's the same way for people who do decision theory and decision science. You'll see every year somebody will come out and say, we found this new probability theory function for management and oh by the way herb simon said it 75 years ago so uh, a lot of it comes out of that area uh, psychology uh, why do humans make suboptimal decisions you know what is it we're trading off why do we think and act the way we do why are we irrational so much of the time those sorts of things so there's a lot of psychology about it and again computer engineering i'm not going to go into it uh, the other ones that you're seeing a great deal of right now are control theory and something called cybernetics. And this is really how do we get machines uh, when you see automated factories. The factories themselves can be learning implements, and this is based on feedback controls that they're running down the system where it'll look back seven or eight processes to try and figure out where the error was in the manufacturing process. And the Tesla factories in particular are the leaders in this for the automotive industry, although chip manufacturers and others are there with them. Uh, the big ones are linguistics, and that's what the course is going to talk with uh, about this term, uh, because I do think the assignment is most generally gonna lend itself to language propagation or generation. Although there may be some students, particularly if you're adept at Java, which is a computer coding language, if you want to do Java, be my guest. Uh, the GPT-3 algorithm is extraordinarily good at Java for some reason. So where are we today or this afternoon? It's all changing that quickly. As I said, just yesterday, Microsoft announced that they are going to integrate GPT-3 into PowerPoint, Microsoft Word, and several of the other applications in the Office suite. 
And that's really a game changer. Uh, I guess by way of disclaimer, Microsoft has about a billion dollar, that's one with a B, billion dollar stake in um, OpenAI. OpenAI was recently valued at about 29 billion. So um, Microsoft doesn't own that much of it, but they're integrating it already. So what are the big topics in AI these days? Uh, one of them is search. So our friends over in California, Silicon Valley, Sergey and Sergey and Bryn, uh, Google to you and I, or uh, Alphabet, they are very big into this. And they're important because I'll talk for just a minute about where these data programs are trained. Nobody has more training data than Google. Uh, so they are very powerful and they are using it and they are shaping your search as you know it. You can also use OpenAI for search, by the way, if you want to. Uh, how to represent knowledge and reasoning. Uh, one of the things, and I'll do it tonight when I open up OpenAI and show you, OpenAI is, uh, GPT-3 in particular, is very good at summarizing and simplifying very complex ideas, essentially writing the abstract for your paper. Uh, the other areas relate to planning, learning, planning and learning. With planning, it's what is the critical path? What are the simplest, fastest ways we can get things done? Recently, there was a big breakdown uh, at Southwest Airlines due to a storm. And that really went back to their computer systems not being able to adapt. And I can assure you when they upgrade them, it'll have some AI component that's running behind it, or at least a machine learning sort of aspect. Uh, again, natural language processing. This is huge in healthcare because physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and other people will write fairly extensive open narrative into a medical record. And that doesn't really translate into anything that people who do research or people who do billing can turn into <coughs> a payment mechanism. So natural language processing reads what a doctor says and says, okay, I can bill for this, 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 and this, and sends off a bill. Very important. If you're in healthcare and want to do that, there's a career for you. All right. And the last one is this generative AI, and that's what we're going to be talking about when it comes to GPT-3, and the G stands for generative. So where are we in the life cycle of this particular technology? There's something called the Gartner hype cycle, and I've shown a picture of it here. And uh, the expectations of what will happen are really at the peak of inflated expectations, which if I can get my cursor, is somewhere around here. Uh, we're already starting to see issues with GPT-3 in particular. Uh, there was a fairly famous Wall Street Journal columnist who went back to high school and turned in uh, an English essay on Ferris Bueller's day off. The problem was GPT-3 didn't know who was Ferris versus who were the other characters in the movie. So it was sort of um, disheartening that it wasn't better at those sorts of things. Uh, you get into something then called the froth of disillusionment and you may reach that somewhere during the next seven or eight weeks of class where it doesn't do everything you hope and then we get to this thing called the slope of enlightenment and productivity where you really do figure out what it's good at and what we can use it for and i don't know if the time frames are right i mean we are moving so fast as i've indicated a couple indication uh, times here this is happening in hours, not days, not weeks, not years, the progress. Somebody was asking me earlier about GPT-4. It does in fact exist. Um, I don't have access to it. So how do we test to see if something's an AI? And I'll just mention this briefly. Uh, the classic example is the Turing test. Uh, Turing was a, a per, an Englishman who worked for the British government during World War II. He helped break something called the Enigma encoding machine, which is what the Germans used to code all their messages. 
uh alan turing is his name there's a very good movie about him by the way uh, uh starring benedict cumberbatch and it really does uh articulate a lot of what he did worth watching uh at any rate the turing test essentially says if we put up a screen and put you at a keyboard as a person and you start typing in questions and having a conversation can you tell whether or not what's being fed back to you is coming from a human being or a machine. And to the extent that you can't tell whether it's a machine or a human being, the machine might then be considered to have passed the Turing test. And there have been a lot of complaints about this, by the way. The Turing test will by no means be the end of an AI. Uh, the machines have already sort of surpassed our ability to tell them apart. If you've ever been online with a company and been in their chats, they're fairly good, some of them, at approximating human behavior in very structured conversations. Uh, one of the funny things about GPT-3 is it's not good at telling jokes, and it doesn't seem to get puns and the like, and that's sort of where it really falls down on the Turing test. So here are a few of the cognitive tasks. Again, what we're having here tonight is natural language processing. Uh, I introduce topics and examples from other areas of life that may connect with you as an audience, and that's the natural part. And the hope is that you will process what I'm saying in a more effective and deeper way. Uh, knowledge representation, uh, how do we store and represent information? This is a very big problem. Uh, computing is not infinite, despite the fact it seems that way, and certainly our capacity to store has grown greatly, but how do we represent knowledge quickly and easily? Recently, there was an article, and it was just a lay person, um, again from England, who decoded some of the cave drawings and the marks around them, and essentially has said that some of what we're seeing in cave drawings that was, you know, previously just pictures of ox and sheep and other animals that they were hunting, they actually figured out that, no, they were documenting the seasonality of the hunts and how successful they were and weren't. And it's been a revelation of recent in the historical realm and how they represented that knowledge with dots and X's and fairly innocuous looking marks is really quite interesting. There's another example from Peru. The Inca used to communicate with uh, threads of strand, or strands of rope, essentially, and they would tie knots in it, and the knots represented things. And they've only recently started to understand the very basics of what this knot system meant. And it was very effective, though, and able to convey a lot of information in relatively short order. Uh, one of the big areas in healthcare is machine learning. Machine learning is exceedingly good at uh, analyzing diagnostic images in healthcare. Uh, in particular, the areas of mammography have benefited greatly. The machines are very good at finding early stage cancers in women. Uh, and that's a huge boom. Catching a cancer at stage one or two versus when they were traditionally caught by human readers at stages three and four makes a huge difference in what the treatment possibilities are, lumpectomies versus mastectomies, chemos versus other more radical procedures. So machine learning has already been a boom in the imaging field for healthcare. So what's the case at hand? Generative language processing. Uh, previous versions of generous lang uh, uh, generative language processing this is all based on your training sets. How much can you train and how many layers does your neural network have? The two uh, big systems that were used for about a decade were called Elmo and Bert. Clearly somebody like Sesame Street in this field. And Elmo was a two layer bit and uh, Bert was 12 and 24. And the number of parameters, 340 million in the latter, version of BERT. That's a lot of parameters, more than you and I can probably process in any given moment. 
and 24 layers. Uh, the layers matter because it informs how we can understand what the machine is doing. In other words, we really don't know what it's processing in 24 layers. So here's the more recent versions, and I put these two early systems, Elmo and BERT, up against GPT-3 and the current version. And the one that we'll be using for this course uh, has 175 billion parameters. Compare that to 340 million. Uh, the number of layers went from 24 to 36. And the learning rates, and these are big numbers. Uh, I'm trying, I'll have an image here. Let's see if I can jump down to the image, the tokens. I, I can go into that later. The important part is how many bits of information are being used. This is a logarithmic scale. And I can't tell you enough how important this is. Every time you go up an increment, you're multiplying not by two, but by tens and hundreds and thousands. GPT-3 uh, is currently winning the uh, scaling war. Now, what did GPT-3 use? Uh, it used the internet. It sent out a web crawler, a spider, and looked at a significant amount of the internet. So you may have heard the expression garbage in, garbage out. This has led to some problems with GPT-3, and it has many of the biases that we see in the internet writ large. So be very, very cautious. Okay, there's a long one. Yeah. To give you a more graphic picture, this is the difference. <laughs> you can see how much bigger GPT-3 is than even earlier versions of GPT-2 and 1. And Google's T5 is sort of the next version and even it's just orders of magnitude behind. So what does all this scaling bias? That's the real question. And the answer is OpenAI's GPT-3. And it's just been remarkable. Its ability to simulate the human condition is nothing short of miraculous. Uh, so for those of you who want to do this in class, Here's the controls that you can use, and I'm going to switch over and show you uh, my playground, and we'll do a little work in there. But you essentially have a few elements. The first one is this temperature uh, feature, and this does matter. <laughs> Although you have two versions, you can either use the temperature sl slider or the top P, and I really can't tell the difference. And by the way, the people at OpenAI can't tell you the difference, best I can tell. Uh, but they tell you only use one. And what is this doing? The temperature is essentially telling you how much variety to give. If I were to ask the average human being, what's your favorite kind of pet? And I turn the temperature to zero, the answer would be dog. If I turn the temperature to 0.95, the answer would be, I don't know what, uh, Brazilian cuttlefish or something, you know, something highly unlikely and high variety. So putting the temperature at some point that gives you requisite variety is not a trivial matter. The other alternative is to use the top P. Uh, and again, this is a parameter it's only a slightly different way of randomizing. Uh, I typically set mine to about 0.5, and that has worked well for me in my efforts, and I'll show you one of those momentarily. The maximum length, this relates to actually tokens, not the length of what you're preparing. And uh, the tokens are, are what we pay for, although tokens are fairly cheap. And I'll give you access to my OpenAI site and hope that we don't break the bank. Uh, there's something called uh, frequency and presence. I showed you those sliders. Uh, the frequency penalty reduces the likelihood of a word being repeated, particularly in a sentence. So if you're hoping to get some requisite variety, you probably want to decrease the frequency. 
So you up the score there. And similarly, the presence uh, does sort of the same thing. You'll have to play with it. That's all I can say. Uh, the best option, I typically set the best option to between five and 10. And what this is doing is the GPT-3 will actually run it four or five times internally and give you what it thinks is your best answer. With that said, you can then rerun it and get a different answer. And I often find that rerunning it gives me better answers time over time. So what are we going to do? The most important part of any GPT-3 entry is the prompt. And here I've given you an example. This is the prompt part here. And I told it to write 250 words on what information healthcare leaders need to manage healthcare issues and to make effective strategic decisions. So I'm going to copy that. I'm going to stop sharing here. I'm going to start sharing. Firefox, and I'm going into GPT-3. This is the OpenAI, and I am in the API for GPT-3, and I'll type in that same prompt, and I'm going to go ahead, and you'll notice in my documentation, and I recommend you do this too, that I'm going to set the temperature to 0.7 something. I'm going to make my maximum length. So I just, I'll leave it at 64. That won't be the same as this. I've already told it I want 250 words. I'm going to make my top P 0.9. I'm going to make the frequency penalty 0.95. Presence penalty 0.95. And I'm getting this off of other people who've done similar work. So, and I'll make it the best of 10. There are other fields. You can tell it where to start and stop. But if I do this, motorcycles, all right, motorcycles, motorcycles, motorcycles. Sorry about that. Let's try it again. Just reset that real quickly. And then I'll hit submit. And this is what it gives me. Healthcare leaders are constantly faced with complex healthcare issues that need to be managed in order to make strategic decisions, blah, 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 blah. I don't really like that. So I'm going to come back and say sub. I'm going to delete that, and I'm going to submit again. And you see it's now giving me more sophisticated answers. Okay? And that's non-trivial. So this is how this works. What you put here is the most important. There are many examples where people say, Write 250 words on healthcare leaders need to manage complex healthcare issues and make effective strategic decisions. And then I could put in something like in the form of the King James Bible, and it would make it sound like Bible verse. There's been lots of examples where you put in goofy things and it uh, does goofy things. Let me give you one other example. So by the way, I'm going to switch over. I actually did this. And then I'm going to
I edited a journal and I wrote an article called The Artificial Intelligence Answers and Editor's Questions. It's by me in collaboration with GPT-3. Here's the prompt I just showed you. And notice I report out all of my settings. So if somebody wanted to try to replicate this, they, they could. And here, after several iterations, is what GPT-3 gave back. And it was an extraordinarily good answer by my estimation. And I'll be happy to share this with people who are taking the class. Uh, with that said, the GPT-3 was very policy oriented and what I would call command and control and really tended to neglect the human condition that I would say most hospital CEOs focus on. So that's sort of what I've done there. So that's my first example. I've done it, you can do it. And that's maybe how to think of the assignment. The other thing you can do, and I'll show you something. Today, my colleagues and I submitted a paper to the Academy of Management called The Impact of Policy Incentives on Electronic Health Records Related Burnout in Ohio. And here's the abstract. Here's the paper. We wrote the purpose, who the findings model, we gave a conceptual model, et cetera, et cetera. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the data collection and the results section Command C, then I'm going to switch over back to the API, and I'm going to write summarize the findings of the passage below. And here's GPT-3's result. When asked how much time they spent on average, so it's essentially giving a, fun, a summary of the results. This is not a great summary, in my opinion. I might actually make it do this again, and why not, since I don't like it. A little better. I'll tell you one thing that's becoming clear to me, even as I watch this, is that the insert tables is throwing it off. Therefore, going through and getting rid of that feature out of the text might serve to make for better results. So there, let's see if we can give it a little better. So here I'm improving the instructions, telling it how many words I want. And here you can see it's starting to give me better results. The point being, play with the system, get it where you want it, and it'll start to do great things for you. All right, let me stop that. And we'll return to All right, so the prompts are the most important part. Oh, the other thing about prompts, 
I would tell you if you're having this, using this to write an entire paper, break it up into sections. Uh, GPT-3 gets worse as it gets further down the line, as it gets further away from its initial comments. It's essentially taking probabilities on probabilities of the follow-on words. That's not technically how it works, but it gives you an idea of the limitation and therefore breaking it into parts. I might write something like, give me an introduction into the ideas of electronic medical record use by physicians and its impact on burnout. Give me a theoretical model that would explain would be my next prompt. So new prompts for every section of your paper will probably give you better results. Again, adding examples of text will also improve your results. And you can provide the examples right into the playground, just as I did. And the last thing I'll say is uh, sharing and publication. Please be sure to document fully what you've done. Uh, I think that's only fair. And especially if you're going to use this in other classes, uh, it's worth mentioning that you've done it. Uh, I don't know how other faculty are going to react to that at this juncture, but I think it's a fairly open question. If you go into uh, OpenAI, they have all sorts of documentation, and I recommend you use that uh, a great deal to guide how you use the system, as well as how you document what's going on. Again, I think it's a playground, as they call it, messing with it a lot and changing things around gives you different and better answers potentially. And I think it's a great tool that'll have lots of value going forward. There are other things you can do and I didn't show you here. You can integrate this into spreadsheets, web pages, search engines, all sorts of things. It's the possibilities just go on and on. And for those of you taking my class, if you want to do those things and, uh, you know, go above and beyond the assignment. I love that. All right. So I will stop there. Thank you. Any questions? Got any questions? Dr. Ford, this isn't a question. This is, I think, you know, because it is so new, um, it's it's intriguing. Um, and just, you know, delving into it and see how um, it could be used is going to be interesting. Oh, it's, I think the part that's alarming people so much is how easy it is to use. Yeah. Um, because I do have a nephew who is <laughs> an associate professor at uh, North Florida. And he was like, what? He goes, I'm going to look a little bit more into this, you know? So, um, yeah, I, it's interesting. Well, so some of the cautions from the educational side are, mm -hmm. we already know, like the paper I wrote for my own journal, uh -huh. I took what GPT-3 gave me and turned it into the plagiarism checkers that we have, turn it in, things like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know that something other than a human created that as new. So that's the big concern. Mm -hmm. With that said, it's not replacing you. Um, the hardest thing as an author is facing the blank page. And I think for many people, this gets them past the blank page to something where they're editing and adding their own content. And I think that's a good thing. I also think there, that there will be people who are not forthright about using the tool and how it influenced their work. 
And I think that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, and I also think it's nonsensical. I, I think being good at using the machine reflects well on the human as well. You know, using the machines wisely reflects well on you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to, to use and play around with. I'm looking forward to it. All right. So what I'm going to do is tomorrow I'll send out a survey and people who want to do the uh, AI assignment, I'll load them up into my account so that they can all go and use the full functionality. You can also, by the way, uh, uh, you can go in and use the other tools for creating pictures, for creating code if you want to, because that's all available in there. So people are using it to create PowerPoints. That would be helpful. Yes, very helpful. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that Microsoft is putting it into their suite. I, you know, um, wow. Well, I think the big thing will be, and somebody mentioned earlier, GPT-4. Uh, what I would like to do, the project I'm actually doing next is um, I'm going into the NIH's grants mm -hmm. and I'm downloading all of the ones that they funded. And I'm using that as the library for a reference. And then I'm going to ask GPT-3 to write the grant. Wow. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Again, you have to break it down into the parts. You know, there'll be the specific aims. There'll be the background, oh. methodology. <laughs> I remember it well, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah All this, right. would, this would have been a great tool to have. Let's put it that way. Indeed. Oh, we have it now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all, and have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Ford.